Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Stressful. Politics, work, traffic, bad breath, money, relationships, friends, final exams, practice, potty training, dentist appointments, the news, social gatherings, meetings, the DMV, keeping up with the Joneses, in laws, getting some sleep, grocery shopping, phone calls, car repairs, house repairs, pets. <sighs> Find peace in the chaos of life. Unplug from the stress. Recharge your soul and God. Connect with the people you love. Start the new year in peace. Calm the home down. All right, let's do just that. Happy New Year. So glad that you're here on the first Sunday of the new year, whether you're brand new or whether you've been here a long time or anywhere in between. We're going to go to Philippians. That's in the New Testament. So you can be turning there in your Bible. And if you need a Bible, just wave at one of the ushers. They'll be coming down in our aisles and they'll be glad to loan you one. And you can keep it as our gift to you if you need a Bible. So <clears throat> I think it was 13 or 14 years ago, uh, Suzanne was pregnant with our firstborn and I was having all the natural apprehensions that first time dads have wondering, will I be able to do it? And how's it going to work? And can I be a good dad and all those sorts of things. At the same time that I was feeling those sorts of feelings, I also was, uh, sort of bearing this burden of trying to raise millions of dollars for, to build this place so that we could get out of the school that we were renting from the Klein ISD and to get moved over here. Many a night I was lying in bed wondering, but what if we don't raise the money? What if we count up all the cards and we just like fall way short and we can't build a building? And what if the school says, well, sorry, you've used up your time here. And what if I, what am I going to tell the people? I don't know what we're going to do now. You know, and, 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 and I noticed something in my body just wasn't feeling right. Uh, so, so conspicuously that one day I said to Suzanne, this is not right. And she said, okay, what, what do you want to do? And I said, I, th I, I want you to take me to the emergency room. So she got me in the car and we drove to the emergency room. Well, they worked me over for a few hours and they finally said, we can't find anything wrong with you. We, we think you're good to go. So I felt so much better for a while. But several weeks later, it was back and I was feeling this feeling and I was like, oh my gosh. And I said, you got to take me. So she took me to the emergency room again. Again, they said, there's nothing wrong. You're good to go. We did this two or three more times. Finally, one day she pulled in with me to the emergency room. She reached over and took my hand, looked at me, and she said, now, I know that you're going to be fine. So much so, I need to run to the grocery store and do some errands. And so... <laughs> You just call me when they say you're good to go and I'll come pick you up. But it wasn't funny because I knew there is something wrong with me. I could see my hands were sort of tremoring and I could feel my teeth. I was like, so I am coming apart. Something is wrong. So I decided I, I got to take matters in my own hand. I went online and I'm going to figure out what I have. And within a few hours, I figured it out. I would figured out the grim truth. Nobody had the heart to tell me. Either I had Parkinson's or Lou Gehrig's disease. <laughs> I just knew. And especially if it was the latter, I knew I'm not long for this world. And after that, I began waking up every single morning. I would just wake up sobbing. I would be lying there in, in my bed just sobbing. I was just sad, sad because I wasn't going to ever get to meet my firstborn son. And I wasn't going to ever get to see the church get out of the school and come over here. And I was just sad for anybody who might miss me. And, and I was just feeling all these sad feelings. And, 
And it, it, was just, it was just going on and on and on. And, uh, and then finally, at the strong encouragement of several key people in my life, I went down to the medical center and had a, an appointment with a very good neurologist and who worked me through a whole battery of tests, spent a whole day down there. And finally, the neurologist came in at the end of the day and said, well, Mr. Worline, I have good news and bad news, but mostly good news. The good news is you don't have Lou Gehrig's disease, you don't have Parkinson's, you don't need to go to the ER every month anymore. You, you, you really, you really, we don't see any problems there. But the bad news is we do believe you have what is called chronic anxiety. Now, see, everybody's brain has what, it's right between your temples. It's a portion of your brain that's called your amygdala. Your, your amygdala is like your alarm system. It's the part of your brain that kicks into action before you even know how to respond. Like in, a, in an emergency, if a car is barreling towards you, and before you can even calculate what's going on, your amygdala is already solving the problem and deciding what you're going to do. It speeds up your breathing, brings more air into your lungs. Um, it, it, it makes your pupils dilate, makes you ready for fight or flight. Your amygdala does. Basically, the neurologist uh, was saying to me, but your amygdala is overactive. It's never settling down. It's leaving you in this heightened state of alertness. And uh, subsequently, your brain is never getting to enjoy the, the endorphins um, and the neurochemicals like serotonin that relax your brain and, and calm you down. Now, I don't mind telling you that embarrassing story because I now know I'm not the only person that deals with anxiety and worry and stress and those sorts of feelings. And as a matter of fact, statistics show that nearly 50 million Americans feel the effects of panic and worry and anxiety and all. Even if you're not one of those 50 million that feel it up to your neck or your nose, all of you feel it somewhere along the way. You feel it up to your knees or your waist. I know that you do because I read your prayer cards. We get hundreds of these little prayer cards that you send it every week or that you fill out online. And I read those and I feel your stress. I feel your anxiety even when I'm reading through them and praying. What if I don't close the deal? What if we don't um, get a bonus? What if the company restructures and downsizes and I'm out? What if the house doesn't sell? What if the lump is cancer? What if my child doesn't make the squad? What if my child doesn't get to the school that we want? What if the child never turns back to God? What if North Korea really does get nuclear weapons? What if our president slips and accidentally falls and hits the button on his own desk? There's just so many things to worry about. And I pick them up as I read your prayer cards. So this word worry in English, we get from the German word worgen, which means to strangle or to choke. And that's a very good word picture for precisely what it does to us. And it doesn't just do it to you. It has an impact and an effect on your home. Worry and anxiety, and stress, they all, they, it has a trickle down effect. So you say to yourself, that's oh, just me, it's not them, they, they'll never notice. Oh, they notice. It trickles right on down and makes you less able to interact and be attentive to your spouse. It makes you less engaged with your children, it makes you less enjoyable to be around for anybody, it makes you less enjoyable for yourself. And so don't think nobody really knows what's, oh no, they feel it. It trickles down and everybody's tensions roundaboutly begin to escalate. So now in the postscript recording, I'm gonna talk about a bunch of other stuff that I just don't have time to talk about right now. I'm gonna talk about why is it so bad at all time highs in the United States of America? Um, I wanna talk about medication, the pros and cons, and what, is, what do we to think about medication spiritually speaking? And what about our kids? And what do we do if our kids have anxiety issues? Um, and what sources or resources that I'm using as I prep for this series, I'll share those with you if you wanna do some extra reading. And any other things that you text in, questions that you have that you want me to talk about. But we need to move on uh, to say this, worry and anxiety, 
These are not new developments. They're not new to our culture in our time, in our era. Oh no, they were clearly around in Bible times. And we know this because the Bible talks so often as well about them. Keeps coming up in the Bible, going way back into the Old Testament. So this is nothing new. We're not the first people to feel these sorts of feelings. I guess you could say that that is good news. Who better could we learn from as we turn to God's word on this subject then from the Apostle Paul. Why the Apostle Paul? I'll tell you why. Because if there was anybody who lived life in a virtual paint shaker like you see at Sherman Williams, it was Apostle Paul's life. His life was always being bombarded by things. As a matter of fact, at one point he tells us, look, I've been to prison many times for my faith. He says, I've received the 39 lashes on five different occasions. Once I was left for dead, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, literally with stones, three times I was shipwrecked, I've been hungry, I've been thirsty, I've gone without food, I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. And we gather from a couple of verses that he was probably at least half blind. So Paul's life was near always being assaulted by instability and by turbulence. And so we're going to read this letter today and in the weeks to come. We're going to be in the book of Philippians here in the New Testament. The interesting thing about this book, Philippians, is that he wrote it while he was in prison. Paul did. But you would never know that. Because to read it, you would think he just pulled into a five-star luxury resort. No complaints, no problems, no grudges, no fish shaking at God. Why is this happening to me? Nope. None of that, no worries whatsoever. Now, what I wanna do today is I wanna read four verses to you. They're arguably four of the most familiar and favorite verses of the whole Bible. But we're not gonna preach or cover uh, but the first one. I wanna come back next week and we're gonna keep working through this text. But I'll read all four verses uh, to you right now. Chapter four, starting at verse four. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious for anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I know what any number of you are thinking right here. You're like, the verse seven is the one. Could you just like scooch on down and get to verse seven, that peace of God, that's really what I want to feel. Well, it's sort of like an algebraic equation that Paul was giving us. It's sort of like, well, you got to have A plus B plus C if you want to get to D. And so you can't skip over A and B and C. You expect to get to D if D is peace. So we're going to go in just in, in this verse four today. Rejoice in the Lord always. Now, again, let's get in the context. What's going on? He's in a situation which if you or I were in this situation, at least I speak for myself, I'd be going, help, get me out of here. I am in jail and I shouldn't be because I didn't do anything but follow Jesus. You don't pick any of that up from him. Quite the contrary. He's like, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Now this verse has been known to burden a lot of Christians to make overextended, weary Christians, weary Christians just feel like, oh my gosh, you're just adding the straw to the camel's back right here. Because what they hear is, hey, I'm stretched out. I'm feeling pulled in all directions. I feel like a Lego and all my prongs are snapped up. I'm exhausted. I'm frustrated. I'm discouraged. And now you're telling me throw a little joy in there so I'll at least look kind of spiritual. That's not what he's saying at all. That's not it. So why does he say, Rejoice in the Lord always. Keep on continually rejoicing. That's what he's saying in the original language. Continue. Just keep on rejoicing. Here's why. Because Paul understood that what you're going through is not nearly as important as whom you're with as you're going through it. Shakespeare, he understood this. And this is what he was writing about when he gave us the story of Romeo and Juliet. I mean, if you remember the story, you have these two lovebirds, but they came from these families that were dueling families, feuding families that despised each other. But even though all that hatred was swirling around, these lovebirds, when they were together, all was right with the world. Why? Because they were getting to be with each other. And Paul is saying, hey, 
If you're in Christ, you get to be with Jesus. He is with you. No matter what happens, even if you die, all the more you win because you get to be with him then. Paul understood if you have Jesus, you have the inside lane on the track to keeping this abiding quality of joy, you do. Because you are with the one who is your mighty fortress and your sure foundation, your solid rock, your strength, your rescuer. If you're with him, Paul's saying, why on earth would you be anxious and upset and worried? But we are, aren't we? <laughs> Most all of us here, there we are. Sort of like this. I mean, uh, let's see if I can illustrate this in a pedestrian sort of way. So some years ago, I was driving along, and one of my sons was sort of connecting some dots about what my job is. And he said, so who was at Faith Bridge before you were there? I said, well, actually, nobody, because, see, I started it, which proves to you, son, you don't have to be the smartest person to be the leader. You just have to get there first. And <laughs> he said, so... That means that you're the boss. I said, well, yeah, I guess that's what it means. We don't really use that word boss in, in the church world. I mean, because really, like, technically, God is the boss, right? And um, he said, but if, wait, if, so if you're the boss, then that means you can fire people on your staff. Right, Ed? I said, well, yeah, it does mean that. And we've had to do that a couple times, but... But see, you don't grow a great organization by going around firing people. You grow a great organization by finding great people and then spending most of your energy trying to convince them you want to stay here. That's really how leadership works, son. So he was asking, he asked a few more questions. It was, it was kind of cute just watching his gears. And he was like, he was kind of figuring out. So that's what you do. Now, here's the reason I tell you that story. Because of what comes next that makes it totally relevant to you and me and our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Sometime later, several seasons later, he's older, and we're driving up here one evening on Wednesday night to, to, to youth Bible study. But we'd had dinner at our home, and, and I was bringing him up here. <clears throat> and we get about halfway here, and he breaks the silence and goes, Oh, no! What, son? Oh, no, I forgot my Bible. And if I don't have my Bible, I don't get the points. And if I don't get the points, I won't win the T-shirt. I really want to win the T-shirt. And I'm like, well, I'll just turn around and we'll go back and get the Bible. So I'm going to want you to wear the T-shirt and all that. And, um, and so he's like, no, don't turn around. Don't turn around. Okay. No, because if you turn around, then we won't be early. And if I'm not early, I don't get to play the games. And I like to play the games before the Bible study starts. Oh, what am I going to do? Why did I forget my Bible, Dad? And I'm watching him, he, he's kind of having this moment. And, and I'm sitting there right next to him, thinking of this conversation that he and I had had some time back. I'm kind of chuckling inside myself because I'm thinking, this is kind of funny, son, because we're actually driving to the one little piece of the whole wide world that I actually have some influence. I could probably help you with this one. You know, son, we're driving to a place where I even have an office. And in that office, I got a shelf that's lined with Bibles. I can spot you a Bible tonight. Heck, if we're trying to win the T-shirt, I could text one of the facilities guys and have them wheel five dozen Bibles over to the classroom if that's what it's all about. But he was so locked up in that moment, he was not factoring in my value, my worth, my presence whatsoever. He was just in this world uh, having his moment. And as, even this past week when I was thinking about this uh, message for you, I thought, you know, that's what you and I do all the time. He was doing on a very small scale what you and I do on a large scale, a macro scale with God all the time. Because <clears throat> we're going along in our own lives and <laughs> we have the one true God the all-powerful, sovereign creator of heaven and earth. Right here. He's, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake. I mean, he's just like right beside us. And if that weren't enough, we're even told in Isaiah that our names are written on the palms of his hands. He's got to put his hands. And yet when we come around the corner 
and we meet a stressful situation that we weren't expecting or anticipating and it's overwhelming. We're like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? How did, this is the big one. This is the one that's gonna, you know, and we just, we just melt down and totally disregard the fact that seated right next to us is the very king of the universe who loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus into this world to save us, to rescue us if we needed proof that he loved us. And he said, I'm sending you my son so that that son Jesus could live the life of sinless perfection that you and I couldn't live and die the death of suffering and punishment that you and I all deserved and then that he could rise on the third day and conquer the grave and signify if you're attached to me by faith, if you're tethered to me by faith, you too have life. I assure you of it. You're assured of life, abundant now and everlasting then. So if that's the case, how could we be afraid? I like how David put it, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The implied answer is nobody, nothing. Because I got God and he's got me. He's conquered even death. And it doesn't get worse. I mean, that's the worst thing that can happen, right? So go out there and stand in that circle and remember he's conquered even death, which will befall all of us sooner or later one day, but just march it back from there to where you are and realize he's got all the stuff in between as well. He's got this. You say, you know, this sounds so good, but you know, I don't work at a church and I have a life with real problems and responsibilities and stress. And what do you just tell me, prop my feet up and nibble on bonbons the rest of my life? No, that's not what I'm telling you at all. And that's not what Paul uh, was saying. If, if anybody believed in being responsible and working hard, it was the apostle Paul. In fact, at one point he told a group of people, if you don't work, you don't eat. Okay. So of course you should study for the exam. Of course you should fill out the applications and get them sent in. Of course, you should prepare well for the interview. Of course, you should get the home listed and get the sign out in the front yard. Of course, you should schedule your annual checkups and your eye exam and your teeth cleanings. Of course, you should show up for work. Show up a few minutes early and stay a few minutes late and work hard. Paul's not saying shirk your responsibilities. He's not saying don't show up for work. He just understood something that we don't seem to understand. He knew a crucial truth. If you want to enjoy a soul-sustaining sense of peace, you've got to never, never, never in the midst of all those things that are going along in your life, you have to never Never, never let those things become your main thing. Because your main thing is Jesus. And if you're with him, it matters so much more than whatever is swirling around you. Who you're with is more important than what you're going through. So, you worried about your children? Of course you are. You worried about your job and your finances and your relationship and your health? Of course you are. But don't make those circumstances the center of your universe or else you're going to be destined to frustration and a perilous, paralyzing sense of fear and anxiety and so. No matter what is swirling around you for this, you have Jesus. So rejoice in him. By the way, this is the reason that from time to time, we talk so emphatically about the importance of the devotional life. You remember, I was thinking back to a year ago this month, we did that series that we called Resolve for More on how do you have like personal devotions? I sat in the chair to talk to you, how how you do the, you know, a little Bible study and prayer time. And I wasn't teaching you those things so that you're, oh, one more thing I gotta do on the one more to-do list. No, no, no. What, 
the, those are tools that help us every day to recenter on Jesus, to make sure nothing else <clears throat> is getting into the center or the core of our souls. But Jesus, that's the reason why we spend time with him and pray and, and read his word. That's the reason why we show up for worship, what we're doing right now. Lately, I've been thinking of our worship experience as, as sort of like practice. You know, it's, sometimes it's, you're, we're inclined to say, you know, I just want to show up for the game. I don't really want to go and practice. When's the game? The game is tomorrow and Tuesday when you go back to school. That's the game. This is practice where we get to come in and remind ourselves, okay, you are the Lord most high. How great you are. You're into, this is practice. This is why we, this is, I'm going to really challenge you. Don't miss practice, especially in a culture that has moved to sort of a one out of four. You know, if I show up for practice once a month, hey, that's a good month, right? No, that's, that, because I know I can play forward what that's going to do to your soul. And so don't show up for me, show up for you. Get yourself recentered in him. That's my challenge. To, in fact, I'm going to challenge you, don't miss one of these four Sundays that we're going to be doing this, this, this little series on Come Home. Be here for all of them. Just say, you know, I'm going to do that. I'm putting that first in. And let's see if together we don't make a lot of progress. Now, I know that a number of you, you came in here today and you're feeling a lot of burdens. Um, and I'm not making light of anybody's burdens, of anybody's health, of anybody's situation financially or any other sort of, I'm not making light of it at all. But I just wanna ask you, honestly, do you really think that that cur current circumstance that you're experiencing right now is the one that finally just knocked God off his throne and he's just like, blah, 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 I just don't know what we're gonna do about this one. I never saw this one come. Do you really think that? Don't you realize how presumptuous that that would be? that your problem would finally be that problem that it just, it's out of my sovereign hand. I just, uh, you got one here on me. No, is he no longer the same God yesterday, today, and forever? Is he no longer able to supply all your needs according to his riches and glory? He knows exactly what's going on in your life. But you know why we do this? I'll tell you why we do this. Because when things are actually going along really well in life and it's all working, you know what we buy into the myth of? We buy into the myth of, Finally, I got it all going. I'm controlling this. I'm making this plate spin over. The kids are good and the marriage is good and work is good. And my health is, good. We, we got this whole, I finally got it all together. I'm in control. Finally, the way it was meant to be. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, you don't ever say anything because you don't, well, I wouldn't sound quite right. So you, you sugarcoat it with spiritual jargon and you say things like, well, you know, God is really blessing us right now and God is just so good. God is good all the time and, and it is well with my soul. You say all that, but beneath all that spiritual gobbledygook, beneath all of that, what you're really believing is, I finally got this thing going along the way it was meant to be. At which point God says, mm -mm, no. Sort of like a loving father who's teaching his child how to swim in the swimming pool and you know how you do it? You're like, keep on coming, baby, keep on coming. You know, and, and <clears throat> keeps moving back. Sometimes our heavenly father says, I gotta step back just a moment here, but don't think for a moment that I don't still love you and that I'm not still with you or that I'm not fully in control because I am. See, the problem is that when things are going particularly well, we delude ourselves into thinking, it's because I did it. And then when things start to fall apart, we're like, God, what is going wrong? You're not coming through on your end. See, things, here's the reality. God is every bit in control when things are going well, though you think you're in control. He's the one who, and God is still in control when things are not going so well. He's in control all the time. You were never as in control as you thought you were when times were going well, and he is never out of control as much as you think he is when times aren't going right. Worry and, uh, and, and anxiety, though, they betray our, our truth. 
they betray the truth that we want to we want to hedge we want to have it both ways we want to be like one hand up towards God because I love you God and you are good and you, but I'm keeping this hand free just in case I got to grab the gears because sometimes I know I got to sort of take over <laughs> nothing against your abilities but I just know sometimes I got to sort of do this and 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 we're always going through this life hedging on God and he lets us. He's like, you want to grab the gears? Okay, I'll let you grab the gears. And then we start to panic and despair and stress and anxious and all that sort of stuff, at which point we find ourselves driving in a circle in this cul-de-sac saying, oh my gosh, and we're left with no better option but then to turn back to God, at which point we're like, help God. And he says, welcome home. I'm glad you're back. Since I started with a hospital story, I'll, I'll end with a hospital story. Now this hospital story, though, you actually, most of you know this hospital story. So I'm not going to tell the end of the story um, this time, other than to say, you know what happened. The cardiologist took special care of me, drove me in his car, took me to the hospital, worked on me, saved me from a massive heart attack. And, and that was amazing. And, but even this past week, I was just preparing and I felt like the whisper of the Holy Spirit said, yeah, but you don't talk enough about what I was doing the 24 hours before that last few hours. Let me just go back and tell you, because I haven't talked about that, I don't think, in about three years here. See, the night of January 14th, 2015, Suzanne and I were getting uh, ready for bed and we were brushing our teeth. And, and I remember saying to her, I got to go to this meeting tomorrow morning downtown. And I don't really want to go to the meeting. And she's like, well, are you going to go to the meeting? And I said, well, I guess I'm going to go to the meeting. And the next morning I got up and I really didn't, and I begrudgingly got dressed and I headed down to the meeting, which was an utter waste of my time. And I didn't need to be at the meeting, but you can't leave the meeting once you're in the meeting. So there I am. And it lasted long enough that it was time for an early lunch. And there's a restaurant I like down in that part of the city. And so I said, I'll get an early lunch. And I went and had my early lunch. And even as I was finishing lunch and walking to my car, thinking I'll get back up to the north side, get some work done, still get a good half day of work in. I'm in my car, getting ready to turn left to go back home here. And I get a text on my phone from Pastor Terry, who says, I was just at the medical center this morning, prayed with this family. It's a 12 year old. It looks like he's gonna die of cancer. It's just so, so sad. And I'm sitting there getting ready to, to turn, but I'm thinking to myself, there's the medical center. I could just go, I could visit them myself today. They could get two pastors in one day. I'll just, so I turned right and I went to the medical center, pulled in, found their room, went in. I didn't talk five minutes or 10 minutes. I thought that's all I'd probably be, but, but ended up sitting down. We had a conversation It lasted about 30 minutes, which was just long enough for me to feel these feelings of sort of indigestion that I'd been feeling a while lately. And I remember after praying with that family, walking to my car and getting down in my car and thinking, yeah, I really wish I had an appointment with the, the GI doctor because I need him to do one of those scopes and figure out why am I having this, this bad indigestion. And then I remembered, you've got the cell number of that GI doctor because seven years ago when he did a colonoscopy on you, he gave you a cell number, which you remember thinking, that's kind of unusual, isn't it? But look on your phone. And I went and I still had his number. And so I texted him. I said, Dr. Dobbs, I don't remember if you remember me, but, but the last time we met, I certainly wasn't featuring my best pose. But in any event... <laughs> I'm wondering if you could do the scope that goes down the top side this time because I think I need one of those. And <clears throat> I press send and I remember thinking, that is the dumbest text I ever sent in my life. He'll never, I'll never hear back from that. And started chuckling to myself even. And I put the car into reverse to get on back here. And my phone chirps. And he says, certainly I'm the kind of doctor that could help you. Why don't you come on in? I can get you in today. We'll just, you'll have to sit a few hours, but we'll work you in. So I said, that's great. I'm really near. And I drove over and went in and he worked me in a couple of hours. He, he I was sitting at his desk and we were doing intake questions. And 
something I said triggered a curious uh, question from him. He said, who's your cardiologist? I said, my cardiologist? Actually, I don't have a cardiologist. Which is a real indictment on somebody who fancies himself for his whole life to be such a high-functioning hypochondriac. And <laughs> he said, let me make a call. He reaches over and gets his phone, and he calls Dr. Solomon. He says, I got a patient here, and I don't want to put a scope down his throat until you tell us that everything's good with his heart. Could you get him in? He hangs up. He says, I need you to go over there. And uh, he's going to work you in. It'll take a little while, but he'll work you in. And of course, you know the story from there of how he did work me in and he did get me on the treadmill and it did malfunction. And he sat me down and he said, you're going to die of a massive heart attack in the next few hours if we don't do something now. And he drove me in his car and he got me in there and he got there first. Even this past week, I was thinking of that story, especially the front end of the story and all those details that I tend to, to, to not talk very much about. And I listed them out. What is it? I think it was like 14 or 15 pivotal turns that if you took out any one of those, the whole thing would have fallen apart. And I'm convinced that was the day that God saw fit to tell me it is time for you to quit hedging. One hand towards me, one hand on your gears. It, how many times did you go to the hospital, I sensed him saying, because you thought something might be wrong. And it never was. But then the one time there really was a problem, you missed it. But I didn't. Because I am the Lord Most High, and I've been guiding your every step along the way. And Susanna's my witness. That was the night I could not sleep because I was so manic with joy and a renewed sense of his presence in my life and his sovereign control over this whole world as I just kept going back through it and texting people all night long and I couldn't sleep and I was giggling and rejoicing. Everybody else was sleeping and I'm just over there whisper praying, God, if the day ever comes, which I'm sure it will, that I'll question, are you really there and what's going on and why is this happening and why did the outcome not turn out so happy this time? I'm sure that that will happen. But God, when that day comes, I want you to guide my mind back to today because I know that I know that I know you are the Lord God most high. You really are in control. And so my question to you is this. What if our heavenly father really is as awesome as you thought he was that time he really came through for you most memorably. He is. <laughs> and that's why Paul said rejoice. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord Always. And it only makes sense, doesn't it? After all, if you have entrusted your eternity to his care, if you've given her life over to him and said, I'm trusting you with my next 10 million and more years throughout eternity, my whole ever after, I'm surrendering over to you, it only makes sense, does it not, to trust him with your tomorrow? So let's do that. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Paul. What a unique person with a unique life, with a unique letter. Thanks for the chance to get to start studying in it today. And for just the reset it gives to our hearts and our minds as we move into this new year to just remember you really are God and you really are in control. Forgive us, God, for all the times that we think I really am in control. I gotta get this whole thing worked out and we fail to acknowledge the fact you're right there beside us. 
Forgive us, God. Friends, if you're here today and you have never trusted in Jesus as your Savior, that would be a good place for you to start right now. You just, you just, in the quietness of this moment, just say, Savior, Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my life. Bring the power of your Holy Spirit. Transform me, change me, forgive me of my sins, cleanse me of unrighteousness. Make me focused on you and your purposes. And teach me what it means to follow after you. But many of us, perhaps most of us right now, we've done that somewhere along the way. We've invited you into our heart. God, our prayer is a little bit of a different prayer. Right now, friends, I'm going to invite you to do just a little prayer exercise. I want you to bring to your mind what your top worry is. Some of you, you've been thinking about it even while I was talking. Maybe it's a child thing or a marriage thing or a home thing or a work thing or on and on and on. Whatever, you know what that thing is. You just bring it just squarely into the forefront of your mind right now. And in the quietness of this moment, I want you to just see in your own mind's eye, not just that problem, but pull the camera back a little bit and see a wider view and realize seated right next to you is your Savior Jesus, whom you've totally left out of this equation. And why don't you, in the quietness of this moment, just take that burden, that problem that you have, and you just put it in your hands, and you just hand it over to him. And let him put his hands around it and say, I'll take this for you. He says, trust me with all of your heart. He says, cast your burdens upon me. But we don't do that. We take them all on our set. You just hand this over to him right now and just say, now, God, I'm asking you to take over. You see it through. You show me what to do. I'll certainly do my part. I'll do the hard work. I'll do the stuff I got to do. But after I've done all those things, then I've got to have some sleep. I've got to have some rest. I'm going to take my hands off and I'm just going to trust. I can't do any more about this. Now I'm surrendering it to you. Lord Jesus. And I pray even this week, God, you would bring many breakthroughs in many lives, in many families, in many homes, that we would see your power and come back to practice next week even more revved up and ready to move closer to you. And I'm asking for all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre and I am joined today by Pastor Ken Warline who just preached part one in our Calm the Home Down series in a sermon called Rejoice in the Lord Always. Pastor Ken, thanks so much for being here with us today. Happily. So uh, you mentioned in your sermon how stress and anxiety right now is at an all-time high yep. in America. Why is that? What yep. is contributing to that stress and anxiety? Yeah. Well, three things at least. The first of those things is the pace of our lives mm -hmm. has never been faster. Right. Our involvement in all of these activities and extracurricular and uh, kids and all this stuff, just like the little setup video was just, it's just faster and faster right. and faster. As a matter of fact, one of the resources that I was reading said that when you go to less developed countries mm -hmm. around the world, the anxiety and stress levels are one fifth Wow. of what they are in this country. But yeah. you transfer people who move here mm -hmm. and it's only a matter of time before now they're feeling right. all those same feelings. Get caught up in the rat race. So it thing. clearly is something that is distinct to our culture, distinctly not good, distinctly mm -hmm. bad. Second reason, the flow of information. Okay. Technology, I mean, you, you can't, I can sit through a meeting where I don't get probably five or 10 news feeds sure. from several news sources that are just like, oh my God, nuclear, war. good night. You know, right. and so we're just, all this stuff is coming in. Yep. And the world used to be a f 
small, uh, a, a, a large, big place, you know, where North Korea and the Middle East, and that was far away. Right. And now it's just very close. Absolutely. Um, and then you add to that, we are a more secularized nation mm -hmm. than we've maybe ever been. Mm -hmm. um, and the church and God and Jesus and everything is increasingly moved to the periphery. Right. So we don't have a built-in apparatus um, that's coming to us uh, even culturally the way it used to be. Sure being the church and God and the Bible. And so, and so we have to strain and discipline ourselves to yeah. keep him at the center. But you add those three things together and there you go. Absolutely, yeah, we're more informed than ever and we have zero margin in our lives and, uh, and God is just simply not a focus on a priority and yeah. it's a bad recipe, which is why right. you mentioned you know, things like worship and prayer and time in yeah. scripture. Yeah. That's kind of the remedy. Um, Absolutely. To this yeah, consumeristic rat race that we all <laughs> kind of find ourselves in. Unfortunately. Yeah, uh, and then uh, I, I wanna talk about medicine though. Um, there's a lot of conflicting feelings about uh, should Christians take medicine? Is it helpful? Um, how do we know? That kind of thing. I wanna know your thoughts on, sure. on medication. Well, uh, so let's talk about the, the pros and the cons. Sure. Uh, if there's a con, and there is, um, it is that we rely potentially too much on medication right. to um, maybe doing some soul work that we need mm. to be doing. Sure. Let me quickly chase that though with the pros mm. because I, the, the Warline family, we are pro medication if and when you need it. Right. Um, <clears throat> so in my situation, the sort of comical one at the start of the message where I was talking about 14 years ago, mm -hmm. and um, the doctor gave me some uh, fast acting medication that I could put under my tongue just to sort of calm me down. You can't mm -hmm. take that for long or else you get addicted. Okay. But at the same time, he said, I'm gonna put you on an SSRI medication. Mm -hmm. Those are the class of drugs that are like Prozac and Lexapro and Zoloft and those sorts of things which are really made for depression, but they work because depression and anxiety is coming out of the same part of the brain. Sure. And he said, now the problem is it takes about a month for this to get into your system. Okay. But this should bring you back to a point mm -hmm. where you can actually get through the day without getting in these loops that you're getting into every five minutes that, that are freaking you out. Right. And we've got to get you back to this place of normalcy so you can actually cope. And then let's get you with a counselor because mm -hmm. you need to start talking right. about, there's clearly too much going on in your life. You got stress and worries and the church and the baby's coming and all this sort of, you know, it's just big. Yeah. But I don't want you just to only do that. I think we got to see if we can settle you down a little bit. And, and that was very, and very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I tell people today, um, I mean, after my heart thing, I take uh, now Lipitor mm -hmm. for cholesterol and an aspirin every day, aspirin therapy. So, and I don't ever think to myself, well, this is a very unspiritual thing that I'm doing. Sure. I think it's a wonderfully spiritual thing that God gave us doctors and technology in this day and age who know there's a correlation with better when you do this. Absolutely. And so I do it. And for the same reason, I believe that it's very important for us to also include in that category, uh, 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 this category of medication, uh, the neurological drugs. Sure. If and when we need them, we need to utilize them. Absolutely. And I see them as a gift from God. Absolutely. Praise the Lord that we live in a day and an age where there are SSIR medications and, and, and other types. Um, and uh, so I encourage strongly, mm -hmm. uh, let's do that because we need to calm the home down. Don't do that in place of though doing the soul work that you need to do, get to a counselor and start talking about it and, and let's grow spiritually in, in all of this um, through it. Absolutely, and that's so important because there is this stigma when it comes to medicine oh, really a lot is. of times like that it's... Especially mental medicines. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, even more so than the other kind of medic medicines. Right, but yeah, like you said, it's, it's important and uh, some of those issues aren't things you can just will yourself to get over, but right. you need help. But like yeah. you said, it's a balance of things of... Yeah 
making sure that you're spiritually healthy and yeah. that you're doing practices to help get yourself physically sure. and mentally healthy while yeah. uh, medication if needed. Yeah. Um, and so that's One important. of the things that I learned through that experience was, as I was talking about the amygdala, not that I'm a neurologist or know anything about this, but I, I've learned a little, and that is that my brain wasn't uh, releasing enough, as I understand it, s serotonin. Right. And that's what a, an SSRI, I don't worry, serotonin something reuptake inhibitor, it is a medication that enables the release of more serotonin exactly. to the brain. Because so you I, can't will yourself to exactly. release more serotonin. And even learning, I was like, oh, that makes sense. Right. And I see how that could be valuable and how I could see it as a God gift. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. That's a, that's a sure. good word. And then I want to talk about uh, children too. I know there are a lot of Absolutely. parents out there who... Honestly, it's it's kind of scary to raise children in this environment that yes. is so full of anxiety and, and stress. And, uh -huh. and for parents, what do, what can they do for their children when they start to notice maybe that their children are showing signs of this Absolutely. anxiety and stress? How do they deal with that? Right. Well, several things come to mind. First of all, um, <laughs> we've got to calm ourselves down. Sure. Um, because there is this trickle-down transference Absolutely. that happens. Yeah. Suzanne and I are convinced that when we're under a lot of stress and anxiety and worry, it the boys start picking up on this and they Absolutely. start acting out. And uh, you just see this whole thing escalating. So mm -hmm. we gotta start with, with you, mom right. or dad. Now, once we're doing that, and that might be enough, but if not, I think it's important for us to look at, okay, what is the structure that we're bringing mm -hmm. to our children? We notice um, with our boys when we are being intentional about routines, about mm -hmm. structure, um, things calm down a lot Absolutely. in their souls. When f things feel like a hurricane in our home, their anxiety goes up, but that shouldn't surprise us, right? right? Yeah. Because our souls are longing for, uh, you know, homeostasis. They sure. they want sameness, and when there is just this chaos going on, there is of course going to be, um, you know, anxiety. Now, um, moving beyond that, still, you say, well, I'm not particularly riled up. Oh, and let me just mention this. This is a le I remember a counselor that told Suzanne and me. And I think this is particularly helpful. Make sure that mom and dad, you aren't projecting mm. your fears into your children. Yeah. Because sometimes we look at our kid and we're like, oh my gosh, if you can't catch a ball, you'll never be in the NFL. And if mm. you're in the NFL, blah, 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 you know, we, our minds are, wait a second, he's a kid. Yeah. So he dropped the ball. Why are you trans, why are you imposing your weird feelings and anxieties uh, uh, upon him? That's right. Let's let him discover if he's anxious about the fact he dropped the ball and he really wants, well, we can go and practice. And you know, But I think that we have to be careful about that. So Absolutely. if we're calming ourselves down, uh, we're bringing the necessary appropriate structure to the home and routines and, 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 and things like that, and there's still a heightened sense of anxiety, um, I think it's important to to visit with the doctor about yeah, that absolutely. because sometimes, again, a little medication can be helpful with a child, especially if you have heightened, heightened, heightened anxiety that also goes by the uh, word OCD, mm -hmm. and maybe a child is doing some quirky things repetitively over and over and over and over. Well, sometimes, I mean, we have a little phrase in, in our family where we say, it's not me, it's my OCD. <laughs> and and that is helpful, but sometimes even yeah. uh, the subject of medication needs to be talked about. And and that's in bounds. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I love how you mentioned too, how important it is not to put expectations or like uh, uh, overwhelming expectations. Yes. On your kids. I mean, because they're already experiencing so much that's competition right. in school and yeah. sports and whatever else. And you add expect like big expectations on top of that. It's right. just kind of keep adding stress and anxiety to their That's lives right. and it's just, it, it can be a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yeah, seeing a doctor uh, if need be, it's it's important yep. to kind of breaking that stigma again. Yep. Um, and then uh, finally, I wanted to ask if you have any suggestions for resources sure that do. might be helpful. Absolutely. Uh, giving credit where credit is due. I am leaning on two 
in particular in this series. One is by the ever popular author Max Lucado, okay. who wrote a book called Anxiety. Mm. I think it's in the last year. And somehow I got onto that, and it's, of course, Max's writing is very readable and very user-friendly and very simple. And, but he's the one who gave me the idea, go to Philippians. And, uh, and so it, that's a great little book. And then there's another book by a guy called Ed Welch. Okay. And that book is called Running Scared. And that's a very good book uh, as well. Uh, maybe not quite as readable or, or s s simple, but plenty readable. Mm. And uh, but I've found both of those, um, in addition to just studying God's Word and using your Bible, and, and we're going to be in Philippians and all. Um, but I'd point people, especially our readers or people who listen to books, uh, either of those two, I, I think you'll enjoy and uh, will uh, be the right way. That's who I'm leaning on. Okay, so Running Scared by Ed Welch mm -hmm. and Anxiety by Max Lucado. That's it. Uh, and then also, uh, I want to highly recommend people uh, definitely check out next week because uh, we're going to be picking up right where That's we right. left off. That's right. We'll start um, in verse 5. In the Calm the Home Down series right mm -hmm. in verse 5. Uh, so Pastor Ken, thank you so much uh, for being here with us and thank you all for tuning in and we hope to see you next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.